Good evening and welcome to Calvin TV. Well, here we are in Main Street, Calvin, and it's the 23rd of February, 2023. Now, 80 years ago, on this night, a horrific fire broke out in St. Joseph's Industrial School. It started at 2 o'clock in the morning, and by 5.30 in the morning, it was realised that 35 children and one adult had lost their lives. It became known as the Orphanage, Calvin Orphanage Fire. To tell us all about that is uh, Sean Galligan, and Sean is one of the founder members of a memorial for this event. Sean, good evening, Sean. This is good a evening, great Anya. evening. It's taken 80 years to get here. Yeah, it's, uh, we're having a good turnout with the looks of things. So, uh, we, being the 80th, we knew we had to do something special this year for uh, in remembrance of the girls who were lost. So, so to get back to that night, Sean, in a brief nutshell, tell us the horrific, the horrific. Yeah. Uh, events of that night? Well it appears that the fire started in the laundry underneath the dormitories uh, at some time around after midnight and uh, some of the neighbours in the shop next door uh, noticed smoke or flames and raised the alarm so the men had trouble uh, getting access because it was an enclosed order of the poor Clares who were in charge of the children who were running the industrial school so the men had uh, problems getting access when they got inside then uh, some of them tried to mount the staircase and uh, the tribunal reports that there was a voice higher up the staircase who said get back down so those men did go back down. It never was revealed who that person blocking their way was. So later on then another group of men tried to get in a couple of times and unfortunately by that stage, within 20 minutes, the stairwell was completely engulfed in flames. So it was a very sequence of events that led to this. And when you say industrial school, it became known as an orphanage. Not really an orphanage. No. But can you tell us why some of these just children weren't orphans? No. Most of them had a father alive from what from the list I've looked through in recent days. Most of them, their mums were either uh, deceased or they were in hospital. They were hospitalised long term. So it seems the fathers weren't uh, allowed in those times to raise their own children. Unbelievable. So Over um, 80 years ago. That, that was the reason. They weren't orphans really at all. Yeah. So. And we do, and uh, tonight you are going to, you have got 35 candles named with each of those children's names on, and of course the elderly cook yes, as well. Yes, we have. Now the children ranged from age 4 to 18. That's so correct, yeah. The young, there were eight from Dublin. In fact, I think the youngest girl was from Dublin. There was eight from Dublin. Uh, most from the Cavan area, but there were some from uh, from Anna. There was two sisters from Belfast and another girl from Wicklow. Skilling. So there was, um, as I said, the older lady, Mary Smith, was 80. And uh, so we're going to have, a, in fact, a 37th candle today. And that's in memory of those who were rescued, who survived, and all the former residents of the orphanage. Because the orphanage was rebuilt, a brand new building after the fire, and it stayed open until the 1960s. So it's been there quite a while. OK, and then perhaps some would say... Maybe it was an ignorance, but to add insult to injury, those children were buried in eight coffins. Yeah, yeah. There were, like uh, some people might say that, you know, the remains were in bad shape, but the inquest uh, clearly stated there were 36 distinct remains, although they were unidentifiable, apart from, Mary, days, apart yeah. from Mary Lowry, who was wearing a, a, a silver cross. But um, there, were, there was distinct bodies. So they should have been, in my view, and I think in most people's view, should have had their own coffin, but they were all put in eight coffins and brought out to Cully Cemetery. And it was only until re wasn't until recently that they got a proper headstone. Yeah, I think uh, I'm not sure was that the 50th anniversary. There is a fine memorial over the grave now, but uh, it, it was a long time too. For a long time, I, I heard there was only a, a plain cross with no names on it. But um, that's why we're working now to get a public memorial in here in the town itself. Okay, so what's happening this evening, Sean? As I said in the intro, there this night, 80 years ago, that fire broke out in St. In, as known now. St Clare's Commons in the St Joseph's Industrial or Industrial School. It broke out at two o'clock in the morning. So this evening you're having a, a vigil of sorts. Yeah, we're having a. We're gathering here. We're going to walk down to the convent courtyard there, where we're going to have the main ceremony taking place. We hope to have most completed within an hour. 
What is your wish overall? Okay, your wish is to have to, to have the information out there, and you're doing that, and the information is now out there, and it's up to anybody to judge whether you think it's got justice or not. But that's mm. another story for another day. But you got national, you got national. We got a lot of um, publicity. They were today. absolutely delighted because we have we got RT on board as well, and um, so hopefully that's what we want to continue with because we want the, that memorial is our goal, and we won't really rest until that is in place. And I'm glad to say this evening, folks, we're going to speak to some family members who are next generation descendants of some of the people who perished in the fire. Well that's it from the town of Calvin. We are now going to go and follow the procession this evening. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, you go Jim, ahead. Sorry. You go Are they going in there, Sean? Yeah. Up here, Brian. Very welcome, friends, to our special evening of remembrance. Uh, after 80 years, we're delighted so many people have come out. So we're now going to call out the names of each of the girls who passed away. Uh, Bernie here behind me is going to do that, who's a niece of one of the girls who was lost, Ellen Morgan. So has, as she calls out the names, if the, whoever's carrying that named candle comes forward, we have one, uh, we have 36 candles for the victims and we have a 37th candle in memory of those who survived the fire. There were five survivors who jumped from the windows or climbed down the ladder eventually. And so we have Karen here, whose mother was from McHugh, Teresa Brady, who not only survived, but actually rescued another girl as well. So uh, Karen has travelled all the way from Cork to be with us this evening. So I'll hand you over to Bernie, and Bernie will start calling out the names. So girls and boys, if you just look at your candle, 
and when you hear that name called out, just come forward and place your candle on this round table here. Thanks very much. Mary Harrison, 15 from Dublin. Yeah. Mary Harrison. Mary Hughes, 15, from Kilachandra. Ellen McHugh, 15, from Black Lion. Kathleen and Francis Keeley, 12 and 10, New Inns. Mary and Margaret Lynch, 15 and 10, from Cavan. Josephine and Monica Cassidy, 15 and 11 from Belfast. Kathleen Riley, 14, Butler's Bridge. Josephine Carl, 12 and 10, from Castle Rahan. <coughs> Mary and Susan McKernan, 16 and 10, sorry, 16 and 14, from Belturbet. Rose Wright, 11 from Ballyduff. Mary and Nora Barrett, they're twins from Dublin. Mary Kelly, 10 from Ballinia. Mary Brady, seven from Balanya. Dorothy Daly, seven from Coothill. Mary Iris, twelve from Wicklow. Philomena Bregan, 9 from Dublin. <laughs> Harriet and Ellen Payne, 11 and 8 from Dublin. <laughs> Theresa White, age 6 from Dublin. Mary Roach, six from Dublin. Ellen Morgan, 10 from Virginia. Elizabeth Hapney, four from Swords. Thank you. Mary O'Hara, seven from Kinnalek.
Bernadette Shearage, five from Dublin. <clears throat> Catherine and Margaret Chambers, nine and seven from Enniskillen. Mary Larry, 17, from Balignac. Richard and Mary Galligan, 17 and 18, from Kinnalek. And Mary Smith, she was the only adult that died in the fire, age 80, she was from Gavin. And as I said earlier, we've just one final candle in memory of all the survivors and all the past residents of St. Joseph's Industrial School. And this has been placed by Karen, whose mother was Teresa Brady from Ballamacue, who survived and saved, rescued another girl as well. So what we're going to do next, friends, is uh, that once again, Bernie and also Mary, who are nieces of Ellen Morgan, and also Sarah Jane, who's a great grandniece of Ellen Morgan, they're going to place a wreath over here. And when that's done, we're going to have a minute silence. All right, thank you. Right, it's just that we have the wreath available just at the moment. So what we'll do is we'll have the minute silence, which we planned first, and then uh, we'll have the, the rain the laying of the wreath then. So just a minute silence please in memory of all the girls. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think the wreath is on its way, so we'll have that place now in a few minutes. Thank you. So we'll be having an ecumenical service right after we lay the wreath. So uh, Father Kevin and... Uh, Reverend Allen and uh, Pastor Ivan, if they're around, then we can, they can be prepared for that, all right?
together this evening to remember the 35 children and an adult who died tragically in the fire here in Cavan. We remember them tonight and we believe that the Lord has welcomed these little angels into his warm embrace in heaven. A reading from St. Mark's Gospel. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, laid his hands on them and blessed them. I'd now like to read another part of scripture. It's a poem that God has given us for times like this. It's Psalm 13. And then I'm going to pray to God based upon this psalm. Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. I'd like to lead us in a prayer to the Lord who hears and sympathizes with us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, the God who has a big heart and listening ears, we pray for each of the families who lost their loved ones in this terrible fire 80 years ago tonight. And Father, we cry out with your suffering Son, how long, Lord, will you forget us forever? How long will this tragedy continue to haunt us? How long will these kind of things continue to happen in our world? How long, Lord, will you forget us forever? How long will precious children continue to suffer in our broken world? How long will children continue to suffer in our community of Cavan? How long, Lord, will you hide your face from us? In our questioning, Lord, we are thankful that your son Jesus sympathizes. Thank you that he understands the many things that perplex and distress us. Thank you that Jesus himself did suffer as part of a despised poor family in this broken world. And therefore he gets us in our sadness. And so we pray for every person who has been affected and is still being affected by this terrible tragedy. We pray that you would bring comfort to the bereaved families and also to those who survived. You know, Lord, the dark cloud that this has left over our town for many years. Thank you, Lord, that you weep with us. Thank you, Lord, for the the work that many on the committee have done to help us to remember those who died that night. Thank you also for the advances in fire safety and building regulations and local authority planning that we've made and we've seen in recent years. Thank you, God, for the emergency services in our county and in our country. We pray for them as they continue to diligently do their difficult work Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the many ways you have been good to us. We also pray for those who rule over us, that you will give them wisdom, making decisions, particularly those that affect our safety. We pray particularly for those who are seeking to protect vulnerable children in our community of Cavan. 
We thank you, Lord, that even in the darkness of these terrible tragedies in our lives, which causes us to, to call out how long, that you also give us real hope. Thank you that at that first Easter, Jesus was willing to suffer so horribly so that he could be punished for our sins. Thank you, Father, that through personal faith in, in him, we can know real forgiveness and the powerful, bright hope for the future that his resurrection brings to all who died that night and to us here today also. And so we pray tonight that each of us will continue to experience, will come to experience that hope in the darkness. And we pray these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for all the children who died in the fire and one adult. Let's remember them all with affection. May we always keep them in our prayers. Lord, hear us. Let us pray for all who were affected by this awful fire especially all who felt and still feel the pain of loss weighing heavily upon them. Lord, hear us. As we remember the children tonight, we pray for the weak, the needy and vulnerable members of society. We pray for peace in our world and an end to war, hatred and violence. Lord, hear us. For all gathered here this evening, that we may be alert to the suffering of those around us, and ensure that they do not have to carry their cross alone. Lord, hear us. We all join together in that great Christian prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord God, ever caring and gentle, we commit to your love these little ones who brought joy to our lives for a short time. Enfold them in eternal life. We pray for all who are saddened by the loss of these children and this adult. Give them comfort and help them in their pain and grief. May we all meet one day in the joy and peace of your kingdom. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to ask Sarah, who's one of our committee members, to say some words of reflection. It is difficult to imagine how this courtyard would have looked 80 years ago tonight, when the darkness of the extinguished streetlights were bled into by the raging inferno coming from inside St. Joseph's Orphanage. This evening, we have retraced the steps of the heroic rescuers who poured from their homes to aid in the rescue and protection of the children. It was through the very archway we walked that the heavy gated doors of St. Joseph's were opened and outsiders rushed in, giving them their first glimpse into the reality of life for children behind these doors and the disorientation of a setting they had no familiarity with. Nevertheless, these men and women with ladders, hoses, buckets, blankets, from all walks of life, rescued five girls from a dormitory window. There is no doubt that without their bravery, all five girls would have been lost to the flames. In 35 minutes, the floor of the upstairs dormitory where the children were trapped gave way and took with it 36 lives, 35 children, and an elderly resident. However, this evening when we entered through the archway, we have come to free the children and place them in 2023 by saying their names, by seeing their forms, and by recognizing them as real children who lived, dreamed, cried, laughed, prayed, fought together, played together, protected each other, and who had every right to grow together into adulthood. These children made decisions way beyond their years, without light and without instruction on the night. It is important to remember their courageous actions and that they are admired because they fought and protected each other right into their final moments as only a child can understand. 
Immediately after the girls first noticed smoke in the dormitory, a child called Mary notified the lay teacher in the room before being sent down to communicate with a living sister in the infirmary. Mary was the one who went to open the gated doors and show the rescuers where the fire began. In the same dormitory, before Mary had even left the room, a girl called Ethna ran down to the dormitory below, woke the children inside and evacuated the room before any supervising adult had e even awakened. It was the children in this dormitory who carried the ill children and babies from the infirmary to safety. At this stage, thick smoke was filling the upstairs and the landings. But a child by the name of Una ascended the stairs to ensure the others had left her dormitory. As she, felt away her, as she felt her way along the beds, she discovered Dolly, a girl who was partially deaf and did not hear the others leaving from the room. Both girls invented a technique on the spot to allow them to leave the choking smoke, put pillowcases over their mouths. Inside the fateful dormitory where the children were trapped, Siblings fought to save each other, with the older girls fighting against the smoke to get the smallest children out. Some girls made the decision to jump, where they were carried over to the hospital across the road by other children who had gotten out. When the ladders arrived, a girl by the name of Teresa directly saved the life of a nine-year-old who had become too afraid to descend the 28-foot ladder. Already out the window, Teresa leaped back inside, grabbed the child by the hair and pulled her to the ladder, putting the nine-year-old on the ladder before herself. Moments later, the floor collapsed. Most Irish families have a deep but unspoken connection to the trauma of industrial schools, Magdalen laundries, mother and baby homes, county homes, as well as various medical or educational institutions established throughout the darkest chapter of the Irish state. It is a wound that still bleeds, refusing to be classed as history, because survivors and their families still live with the past in the present, and with the possibility of affecting generations into the future. Despite being so visible on our landscape, this past is often hidden, whether that is through shame or embarrassment, or a fear of repercussion, isolation, or to not be believed. When we do not speak, we deny that it happened, that we were not affected by the sh and shaped by the events we experienced or that our families live with today. The fire at St. Joseph's is one of the many tragic realities of our past that still bears deep scars within the town of Calvin. However, to advocate for the memories of these children is a form of justice. These children still matter. They will not be lost to time. We are their voices now and we have a responsibility to remember how the failures of a system hurt so many. So let this recognition be our town's greatest triumph. We hope this event can be a flagship to begin the healing process for so many who felt devoid of a place to speak, to feel seen and heard and valued again. There is no shame in this past. For how can a child be made feel ashamed of a world they had no control over? Thank you, Sarah. Very moving uh, words indeed. So we're going to move on with our programme and I'm next we're going to call on the Chairman of Calvin County Council, Councillor John Paul Feely, to speak to you. As we gather this evening in the shadow of these buildings, we think not just of those who lost their lives here 80 years ago, but also of those who witnessed those horrific events. The other residents in the orphanage, the community in the convent, members of the local community who came to assist and guard the Shiokona, members of the defense forces, and those involved in the primitive fire service of the time. Everyone who survived that night, who were present here, must have been marked in some way by those tragic events. The lives of those who died here were, before they walked into the gates of this orphanage, already marked in some way by tragedy. In this commemoration, a great emphasis has been put on giving each victim her name 
and it was very evocative as the names were called out here this evening and the candles placed. It brought a very great poignancy and reality to, to what, had, what happened. I'm thinking this evening in particular of a near neighbour of my own from Glengevlin, Ellen McHugh, who died that night. In almost all accounts, she's mentioned as being from Black Lion. Anyone from rural Ireland knows that along with your name, the community from which you come is very important. She was one of a number of siblings who were sent here to live after the early de death of her mother. Their father was unable to cope after his bereavement. The other siblings had moved on from the orphanage before that fateful night. She was, I think, the last remaining member of her family resident here. In the space of a few short years, Ellen's siblings suffered the loss of both their parents and of their young sister. Each of the victims of the fire have their own story, and it is important that we remember them all. Much has changed in our society in 80 years. The simple cottage from which Ellen came and her family is long gone. Those types of cottages thatched were, the, were far from the ideal of the John Hines picture postcard. They were cold and damp, without running water, electricity, or any of the services that are found in homes today. The support available to a family in the circumstances in which the McHughes found themselves would be very different to what they were 80 years ago. It's easy to look back on those years, look back and think of how we have, how far we've come. It is of course sobering to realize that in years to come, people will also look back on the events of our times. They will look back on things that we think are acceptable and normal and have similar feelings to what we have uh, as we look back on Irish society 80 years ago. On the tragic events that brought children to an orphanage, of how such a place was run, on the social services available in those times, on that basis, I certainly think it best to simply think and reflect on each of the victims. We have come together to remember, just as those who gathered earlier at the graveside remembered the victims of this tragedy, and shortly, people will gather for a memorial mass offered in the church beside us, all remembering in their own way. Reflecting on those events also challenges us, us to reflect on our society today. Tonight, in homes around our county and country, there are children who do not have the support, the affection, the comfort of parents or guardians who are really looking out for their best interests and their future. There are many victims of domestic violence, many lives of adults and children snuffed out without a thought. Just like the children who died here that night, they are deprived of their future and of the prospect of a full and happy life. I want to thank the Remember Cavan Orphanage Fire Committee who have worked with such a spirit of openness and inclusiveness to organize this commemoration ceremony in conjunction with Cavan County Council. I want to thank the children who have participated and of course the clergy who have led us in prayer. Marking the past is vital and I, th I thank them for bringing this matter to the fore of working quietly and effectively, doing so much to ensure that we are gathered here this evening. And I think that commitment is epitomized by Martina Sexton, who was here this evening after the funeral of her own mother this morning. And I extend my sympathy to Martina and the Sexton family who are well known here in this town. As we conclude this event, I am pleased to confirm that plans are coming together for a permanent and appropriate memorial for those who lost their lives here 80 years ago and those who carry the scars physically and mentally in the years that followed. Goramino I have. Thank you, Councillor Feely. Uh, we're almost at the end 
friends. So uh, many thanks to all of you for coming along uh, to this memorial event this evening. Uh, some made long journeys to be here and it's much appreciated. So many thanks also to Calvin County Council for supporting us in our endeavour, not alone uh, in this evening's event, but in our continuing efforts to have the fitting memorial erected in this town in the near future. Something that, that all of the people of Cavan can be proud of going forward. That work will continue from this day until it's completed. So again, a special thanks to Councillor John Paul for his continuing help and support to our committee as we liaise with the County Council on bringing the memorial into being. And also a special word for Councillor Aidan Fitzpatrick for continuing to highlight this subject with the Council. So we'd like to thank also those who took part in our ecumenical service, Father Kevin Fay, Reverend Mark Lidwell and Pastor Ivan Watson for working with us uh, to have the ecumenical service. That's much appreciated. Uh, many thanks to those who have helped us as we prepare for this evening's event. Lisa Brady for providing the candles. The principal, staff, parents and children of Gail Skull Brefney. Jimmy Scanlon, MK Sound. Um, Uh, and also Dunn Stores Cavan and those from the media who have highlighted our events Northern Sound Radio, Cavan TV, the Anglo Celt and also uh, RT Radio and Television your uh, coverage of this event is very much appreciated so I'd uh, also like to thank and I have to thank my fellow committee members past and present who've worked together over many months to bring about this evening some travelling long distances to attend our meetings. So safe journey home everyone, and the next time we gather in Cavan, hopefully it'll be to unveil our new memorial. A thing of beauty that everyone in Cavan can be proud of. So just before we go, a reminder that there's refreshments next door in the Farnham Arms Hotel for everyone who wants to, for anyone who wants to attend there. So we're going to finish up with uh, a couple of songs from a very popular local ballad group called the High Stool Prophets. So they're going to finish off. So uh, uh, thanks to them as well for agreeing to be part of our uh, event this evening. So safe journey everyone. Thank you very much. Is it okay to film this? Yeah, yeah. yeah? No bother. No bother. Yeah. <laughs> Across the town, and I'm home to something new. Getting burned out, with the fire started slow, but soon had spread. When fear took hold of the children in their bed. Life so young, hidden dreams inside. Their pathway to life, viciously denied. A chance was there to flee. I order to prevail. To the daughtry they said, yet again the system failed. And the ladders couldn't reach their way. Families deprived, 
whose broken tongue the locals shed a tear, but no one took the blame. Was it whitewash? Was it fear? And the ladders couldn't reach their way. The smoke had filled their eyes. A fireman and men had tried to hunt him down. As the sirens rang out across the town. No, the ladders couldn't reach their way of cries. The doors bolted shut. And the smoke had filled their eyes. A fireman. Well, what an emotive ceremony. Um, some words, the, there's a beautiful uh, reflection read there and I placed myself back in this courtyard 80 years ago. They called out each of the names of the children then and this time 80 years ago, those children were normal children who went to bed. But by 5.30 the next morning, the, the story was so totally different. It's unbelievable. Now, I'm privileged and honored to speak to a nephew of one of those, a niece, sorry, a niece of one of those children. They were all girls, um, Bernie Conley. And Bernie is a niece of- Ellen Morgan from yeah. Virginia. Well, I have to say, first of all, what a beautiful vigil, wasn't it wonderful? Absolutely wonderful, brilliant turnout. Lovely, and, yes. and to, to remember them 80 years on. And actually, to put yourself back That's it. in That's that exactly 80 years it. ago. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, well, let's talk about the circumstances that got families into those positions long ago. In today's, to a modern day person, it's unbelievable. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, yeah. really, really bad. Yeah, um, my mum, her mother died in childbirth with my auntie Ellen, and it was Ellen, my mum. Mary and her sister Kathleen that was put in here to the school. Um, she wasn't an orphan as, as such because no. she was she, she had, had family, she had her dad, she, she had, had her, her aunts, she had her uncles. But at the time it was seen that um, a man could look after his own children. Unbelievable. And it was the clergy who, who 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 said put these children into these schools. That's it. Unbelievable. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. she had two brothers as well, and they went to the boys. Or in school. Or yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> that happened then. Uh, Bernie, well, how did your family take that afterwards? What was said in your family? What was felt about it? Did you feel? Did you feel bad? Did you feel you did something wrong? Did you feel it was what? What? Did Nothing was ever said. Nothing was ever said. My mum or her, her sister never said anything to either of the families. Was that because they felt they shouldn't or, or they were so traumatised really traumatized. as we know now? I think it was because they were traumatised. A hundred percent definitely traumatised. Um, she definitely wasn't ashamed. She wasn't ashamed of anything like that. Uh, and but I think deep down in our psyche we, we do blame ourselves for things like that. Don't we? we blame ourselves for over the years getting pregnant and having babies outside wedlock we thought we were bad it's not what the system did to us but you know yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but this wasn't to be ashamed it wasn't of. nothing it wasn't nothing to be ashamed of nothing to be ashamed of and on the night of the fire it was nothing got to do with my mum or her sisters it was just yeah bad bad luck and and also as well um the aftermath as well is should be scru is under scrutiny as well. All what happened on the night there was a series of things went wrong yeah. on the night, mm. and also as well that um, that thirty five children were placed in eight coffins. That's it, it beggars belief. That's, that's just that's not unacceptable. It should never have happened. You know, like a, a mass grave, really. Yeah. In all fairness, um, without any recognition. And as was, was said in the reflection as well, um, the nuns were safe. So, uh, to think, what what age would that girl be now if she was alive? 
Oh, she was 10 when she died. She, she would have been 19. 19. She could have been hale and hearty yeah, yeah. and able to Absolutely. tell the story. She could have been hale and yeah, hearty and tell yeah, the story. Yeah. Have you been in contact with, are you in contact with many other survivors Only of survivors? Only here tonight now. I met a lot of people here now tonight, which is brilliant because we will keep them in contact. Yeah. It's lovely to, 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 to exchange the stories. That's it. And they know more than I know. So yeah. it'll be nice for me to get you know, involved with them and to hear their stories yeah. and maybe associate some of their stories with my mum. And one last uh, daft question I want to ask you. Have you got a photograph of her? I do, yeah. You do? Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. Well, Bernie, um, that was emotional for you. Yes. And it's emotional <laughs> for your family. Well, and it was a great evening. Yes. Pro- Cavan has done itself proud this evening. I think so. I think so. I think so. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you for talking to us. Thanks, on Ka- Bernie Cheers, Cavan. Thank you. Thank you for thank talking you. to us thank on you. Cavan TV. Thank Cheers. You. Thanks.